Well, good morning. good morning. My name is Reverend Jenny Carlson. Welcome to worship at Northminster Presbyterian Church. For those of you here in the sanctuary, as well as everyone who is joining us on Zoom today. Uh, a few announcements before we get going. Uh, next Sunday, fall, immediately following worship, we will have our annual congregational meeting. Uh, also on that Sunday, we will have hard copies of our annual report will be available in the Narthex. We will be sending a link to that in the uh, what's happening that goes out on Saturday as well. So if you prefer to have it online or for those of you who are on Zoom who want to be able to have it in advance of the meeting, um, it will be available through our website and the link will go out um, in that email. So that'll be available for everyone as well. Um, for those of you joining us on Zoom, we will open the meeting up to people who are on Zoom. We'll, um, do what we've done before, bring the TV out and move people over to be panelists so that everyone um, who is joining us can be part of the conversation. As you look along the edges, you may have noticed that our decorations have changed ever so slightly. Uh, Lisa Snow Lady has uh, graciously done some beautiful snowflakes uh, representing not just winter, but the individuals um, that make up the church. So part of her inspiration is that every snowflake is unique and different, just like each of the people within our congregation. Uh, so those will be up until we have our next collage class for Lent. And we're still figuring out the date for that, but that we will have a theme and, and we'll be able to um, have you all make some beautiful art for that. If you made art during the Advent class, it is in my office. So if you want to have it after church, um, I'll bring those into coffee hour and you can go through. But um, anyone who, who has one know that um, they're always in, in the office if you want it. Um, and the last thing I wanted to kind of highlight is that we um, have posted our full calendar uh, for Sunday help uh, for the entire year. It is online. Um, and so each week we need um, support in coffee hour, um, worship assistance, so if you want to be able to come up here and read. Um, we are uh, also needing help in Zoom, if that's something that you would like to learn how to try and do. And then um, the Budget and Finance Committee would like to reignite the taking of um, offering plates directly, which means we need people who would be willing to do that. Um, and usually just two people, uh, each worship service is plenty. So um, those are some of the jobs that we have sort of to make worship run smoothly. So if you're interested in doing any of that, please let me know. There is a manual sign up sheet in the library we also have it online and we do try each week to reconcile the two and make sure so um, just know that sometimes we get double sign ups and we'll let you know if that happens but um, we do have it in both places and we work really hard to try and bring those two things together as much as we possibly can are there any other announcements 
Good morning. My name is Dana Hammer, and I'm one of the many people who gets to help plan fun events for our church life and for those outside of the church. So if you're interested in a little lunch today, after the coffee hour, there'll be a few of us that are gathering in the library, probably on the couches, to talk about how we would like to do some environmental stewardship and celebrate Earth Month, which is in April. We may have a couple or two or three different events this spring. So if you want to brainstorm with us and put some plans together, then please meet after church. Um, for those of you on Zoom, I didn't plan for it to be hybrid, but if you were to send me an email at kdhammer at comcast.net, we can put up a link and I brought my laptop and we can Zoom you in. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. All right. Let's go ahead and take in a deep breath and settle our hearts and our minds, remembering that we have been loved since before the foundation of the world. So let us worship God. stand to the call of worship. Almighty and loving God, you have given us eyes to see the light that fills this room. Give us the inward vision to behold in this place. You have made us feel the morning wind upon our limbs. Help us sense your presence as we gather in worship of you. Amen.
You may be seated. Turning to confession this morning, we remember the opportunity to think back on our weeks of the ways that we have fallen short and the ways that we have gone above the expectation, knowing that in both our failures and our successes, God loves us and is with us. With that in mind, please join me for our prayer of confession found in your bulletin. Eternal God, we confess that often we have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Friends, by the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So we have come time to the passing of our peace. So we will um, first uh, share peace with those who are joining us by phone, then here within the sanctuary. And then for those of you on Zoom who have the chat ability, you can send your uh, words of peace in the chat and I'll read those together, us back together. So we extend warm and loving messages of peace to Ethel Hamilton and Russ and Phyllis who are joining us by telephone this morning. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please turn to one another and exchange a sign of peace. Peace to all from Stacy, peace from Katie Tynan, peace from Julia, God's peace and blessing to all from Charlotte, peace to all from Lori, peace and comfort to all those in need from Gary, peace and love from Winona. So um, as Rachel is coming up to do our first reading today, um, just letting you know that both of our readings are going to come from the um, translation that Dr. Gaffney has in the, 
the women's lectionary book. Uh, and so she'll be reading from this. It's not so dissimilar that I felt the need to print a whole version of it. So feel free to follow along in your text and maybe take a moment to notice the things that are different. So Rachel, go ahead and come on up. It's right here on the iPad. Prayer for illumination. Loving God, you provide for, uh, for our every need. You feed our bodies and our souls, yet we hunger to know and love you more and more. Nourish us with your word today. Through Jesus Christ and power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. The first lesson is from Psalm chapter 33, verses 11 to 22. The counsel of just one stands for all time, the thoughts of her heart to all generations. Happy is to the nation for whom the creator of all is their God, the people who, whom she has chosen as her heritage. From the heavens, from the heavens, the most high looks down, she sees all the woman born. From her eternal throne, she gazes upon all who dwell upon the earth. She fashions their heart alike is the one who discerns all their doings. A monarch is not saved by a great army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. False hope is a horse for salvation, and its great mind cannot save. Look, the eye of the faithful one is who revered her. On those who hope in her faithful love, to deliver their souls from death and keep them alive in famine. Our souls awaits for she who saves. She is our help and shield. In her is her our heart glad because we trust in her holy name. Let your faithful love, compassionate God, be upon us, for it is what you whom and we trust. Thank the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Good morning. I hear a couple of people upstairs. They're welcome to come down. And also, I may need, I do need at least one young person who can read a couple words. So we may have to, we may have to pull in Rachel, Rachel or Aquila if, um, if, depending on who comes down from the balcony. So, all right. And while they're coming down, we're going to be talking about some words, and we're going to be talking about the words of Scripture, because I'm curious to hear the translation now that will be in our next reading, the one we haven't heard yet. Okay. I'm going to sit down right here. I'm going to leave my mask on. Okay. All right. We're going to work on a couple of words that are spelled quite alike, but they're different. They're both people. They're both people words. Okay, so I'm going to see if anybody over here can read these words. All right, there are two words on this piece of paper that both begin with the letter R. All right, this may be above first grade level. Yeah. If not, we'll get Rachel and Aquila to help us. Yeah, they're, they're, or sec, are you, I can never keep, is Petra, is Petra a second grader? Are you a second grader now? No, you're a first grader. Okay, I have, I have trouble keeping t- track of my own schedule, much in age, much less everybody else's. Okay, those big words. Okay, what about Rachel and Aquila? Do you can you tell what those two words are? I'm sure. Okay, what are they? Okay, referees are on the top, and refugees. Okay, right. Okay, do you know what a referee or a refugee is? Referee. Yeah, this is, and I'll tell you why I picked these two words. Yeah, you've probably seen ref- referees. Okay. <laughs> we know. Oh, because daddy watches basketball, so you know what a referee is. Yes. And what's a refugee? And we actually have someone who has refugees living with them, right? At least as much I knew. What are refugees? That's a little. That's a little less common. We don't. Well, no, actually, we sometimes do see them on TV now. Periodically, it'll make the news. It's a refugee. That's a refugee. Hmm, that's a trickier, that's a little trickier. Yeah, it's not as clear as the person. It's a big word I've heard, but I don't remember. I think that's a great answer. No, and dad's dad's trying to do theology 101 and it's not working. (laughs) What about what's a refugee? Like an immigrant? Yes, now that's a trick. Yeah, I love Akila's answer. An immigrant, but sort of not. It's like, yes. Yes. So, yes. So actually, how I got inspired to pick these two words are one, I just visited some refugees in, in Asia who fled from one part of Asia to another because um, where they, their homeland is kind of has lots of challenges. And so they fled to another country in Asia uh, to be there. But I also got inspired by, in 2016, the State Department hired you know Grover from Sesame Street. You watch Sesame Street? Did you watch Sesame Street in the past? Yes. How many, anybody out there watch Sesame Street? Okay. The State Department of the United States actually worked with Sesame Street and got Grover, the blue furry monster from Sesame Street, uh, to be with the, who is now actually our Secretary of State, he was the assistant then, he was the Deputy Secretary then, Tony Blinken. They actually did a video, and it's going to be in the chat in a bit, and it's going to be on the Saturday E! News. They actually did a little video about refugees, but of course Grover. Yeah, he got a little mixed up between refugees and referees. Uh, but I actually went and was with refugees. And these were refugees, these were people like Hila and Rachel's age. And one of them was actually her age too. Age, he was six years old. Um, so a lot of these are families. And I went to visit. Yeah. Oh, you're seven. Oh, you're, you've turned seven now. Okay. Petra, I have trouble keeping. 
All right. Well, he's going to turn seven probably later this year, but right now he's six. So he's probably a year behind you, and he wants to, of course, start school. But as a refugee, there are, sometimes you can't start school you know, or you can't go to school. And the ministry I was visiting is actually a school for refugees. Um, because they sometimes have trouble. They don't speak the local language because they're from somewhere else. Um, you can imagine that. Um, or imagine this. What if, you're, what if your dad couldn't work? Dad or mom couldn't work because they don't have the right status to do so. And in this country where the refugees are, they can never legally have residence or, or citizenship. They're just kind of stuck in refugee. But a lot of the implication was, is this family is asking, our, our, our son is six and he's ready to go to school. How is he gonna manage to go to school? Is he gonna get a chance or not? Because it, it's kind of tricky. Where can he find a place to go to school? And so I watched the staff of the school work on that. Now, what if, yeah. And for the older kids, for the teenagers, they notice that every year the classes get smaller because the, the teenagers have to go and try to find informal work. And they can't like a part-time job. That means they don't finish high school. Um, so often it is people from elsewhere, either elsewhere in that country or overseas, they'll sponsor some of the teenagers so they don't they go to school. Instead of stop. I know that's that's a that's kind of a big concept when you're younger that you'd actually have to not go to school. Do you have any questions? Oh, and I have a picture I can show you. Actually, I won't show it online, but you can see me at coffee hour. So here are some of they're like middle school, they're like Helix age. So there are some of them, and they're in English class because they want to learn different languages. So they they don't know where they might end up in the future, so they kind of go like, yeah, English is used a lot of places, that's good. Um, so there's that. See those kids? Yeah? Those kids? There we are. You see? Okay. And so I'm very curious what the translation, when Jenny reads, we're all going to listen, even the older people, because in there are different, in, chap, in verse 3, there are different translations, but in one translation I read, which is NIV, it said, hide the fugitives, do not betray the refugees. So it talks for God's care about refugees, people who have fled from one country to another, like the picture. I mean, there are a bunch. This is from the Libra. No, it's, yeah, we sometimes miss them because often refugees, you know, they make the news a little bit, but then they, then they hide away and we don't see them unless we intentionally find them. And often things like going to school um, or having a, or your parents having a job is hard for people who are refugees. All right, let's pray. God, help us to notice refugees um, and seek them out and really be welcoming of these people who are on God's heart. We thank you for these kids. We thank you that they can go to school and preschool. And we pray that for all kids. They'll have the chance to learn and grow. Because God loves all the children all over the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, John. And thank you, Vicki, for the anthem. That is my absolute, one of my favorite hymns of all time. So that was cool to hear that too. <clears throat> So our second reading comes from Isaiah, and so I'm going to apologize now for the Bible study folks. I changed my mind <laughs> this Monday. Um, so instead of the gospel reading, we're going to um, focus on the Isaiah reading today. Uh, and again, it comes to us from the translation um, by Dr. Gaffney, who um, herself is a Hebrew scholar. And one of the things that we, we talked about this week is that sometimes when uh, we encounter the text, as a Hebrew reading, uh, there is a difference to it when we look at it truly from a Jewish lens instead of what the NRSV, which is often a Christian translation of Hebrew text, and there can be subtle differences to it. Um, so our reading is from Isaiah 16, verse 1 through 5. 
Send a lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah, from the wilderness to the Mount of Daughter Zion. And it will be that like a wandering bird pushed from the nest, so shall the daughters of Moab be at the fords of the Arnon. Receive counsel, daughter, grant justice. Make your shade like night at the midpoint of noon, daughter. Daughter, shelter the outcasts, the fugitive, do not expose. Let them settle among you, daughter, the outcasts of Moab. Be a shelter to them from the destroyer. For when the violence is no more and destruction has ceased, and those who trample have vanished from the land, then in faithful love shall a throne be established, and on it one shall sit in faithfulness in the tent of David, rendering judgment and seeking justice and swift to do right. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I have a few goals for us in um, spending this year working our way through this year W, a women's lectionary for the whole church. And one um, is almost forgettable in its simplicity. Namely, what would it be like if we had spent the last two millennia seeing God as fully female? And there's truly no way to know that. And given the human propensity to seek and abuse power, it's possible it might not have been any different, just we'd have women as the privileged gender. But one of the unfortunate things about justice work is that even when those who are in positions of privilege and power come to a space where they admit the discrepancy and even work and seek to undo it, often they will argue hardest for equality and stand sort of stridently against anything that might be perceived as making them less than. Black Lives Matter gets clapped back as cries for all lives matter or blue lives matter. Feminism gets raked over the coals for being anti-male. The Me Too movement and gay liberation both have carried with it the backlash from men who believe that it will lead women and homosexuals to treat them the way they've always treated us. And in the Disney film, A Bug's Life, this point is made in stark illustration when the grasshopper points out that if the ants ever realized how greatly they outnumbered them, the grasshoppers would be doomed to starvation and death. And one of the most difficult things for those who enjoy privilege, and all of us within this congregation enjoy some aspect of it, either by gender or race, economic or religious, is to be willing to take a step back and allow the injustice to correct itself, even when that means that you yourself have to experience some injustice. Now, in a perfect world, that would not happen, of course. But I also believe that unless you have experienced the randomness, the helplessness and unfairness, the brutality of injustice, it is very, very difficult to truly understand it. When you or your people's very existence is erased from awareness and history, the injustice of the one becomes the injustice of generations. And that is something that most people who have known privilege for generations end up fearing the most. Now this past week was the 130th anniversary of an event that I imagine most of you have no idea about. On January 17th, 1893, the internationally recognized reigning monarch of the Hawaiian Islands Queen Liliuokalani was arrested and held prisoner in her own palace by U.S. Marines. She was charged with inciting an insurrection against the United States. She was tried and convicted in her own throne room, sentenced to five years hard labor. And at this point, Hawaii wasn't even a territory of the United States. 
Queen Liliuokalani was the brother of King Kamehameha, which is a name probably most of you will recognize. And she became queen upon his sudden death while he was in the United States attempting to negotiate a treaty that was less oppressive to the native Hawaiians than the original treaties that had been made with him under threats of violence. Now the thing is, the US military wasn't actually incorrect. When she became queen, she made no secret of the fact that her goal was to return sovereignty to the Hawaiian islands back to its people. Because while the islands were not yet a territory, American business interests and missionaries had been on the islands for decades, manipulating treaties and local culture for their own gains, same as white settlers had done to native peoples all across North America. She was a queen advocating for her own people on their own land in their own country and we went to her door and deposed her. She ultimately signed away her throne and was allowed to live as a free woman. However, she never wavered from saying that she only did that because of the threat of violence. She wrote in her memoir, think of my position, sick, a lone woman in prison, scarcely knowing who was my friend or who listened to my words only to betray me without legal advice or friendly counsel and the stream of blood sat ready to flow unless it was stayed by my pen. Our Queen Liliu Kalani was devoutly religious having been raised Presbyterian. She also wrote music, many of which were hymns, but one, Aloha Oi, remains one of Hawaii's constant anthems. The title translates in the English to farewell to thee and was originally written as a personal goodbye to a beloved, yet has since become the lament of the Hawaiian people over their loss of language, culture, independence, and self-governance. Now the queen maintained her faith throughout her imprisonment Yet the lack of support from her church led her to become more expansive in her faith, attending worship from many denominations, as well as learning about Mormonism, Buddhism, and Shinto practices, seeking to understand God's teaching in many different forms. Now, for some of you, her seeking faith outside of Christianity might be regarded as dangerously heretical, but I see it as someone trying to understand God following a very deep betrayal. She also wrote in her memoir, I may say that although I had been a regular attendant of Presbyterian worship since my childhood, a constant contributor to all the missionary societies and had helped to build their churches and ornament their walls, giving my time and my musical ability freely to make their meetings attractive to my people. Yet none of these pious church members or clergymen remembered me in my prison. In reading Queen Lilikulani's story this week, I was struck by exactly how quickly and easily the ministry, participation, and leadership of women becomes wiped from our memories. And in the gospel reading, which I decided not to highlight today, is basically because it's just a long list of names of Jesus's ancestry. But in the Gaffney translation, she makes a point to name the mothers as well as the fathers, as often as the mothers' names were known. And the scripture has for Jesus's most recent lineage that his parent, that of his parents, in the NRSV, only Joseph is listed, with the caveat that Joseph was his known father at the time but doesn't list Mary at all, the only actual human being in his parentage. Apparently for Luke, it's better to name a not actually true male than a woman. 
And our psalm reading is actually mostly unchanged from its celebratory glory of God, save for using female pronouns instead of male ones. And I have to wonder how that sat with you. If the microcosm of our weekly Bible study is any indication, it may have sounded rough in your ears, even for women. In our quest for justice, we have rightly proclaimed that God exists beyond gender, often seeking to neutralize our pronouns for God, and I am a big proponent of that. But I also think that it serves us to occasionally sit with the fullness of what it might mean to envision God as fully feminine. What aspects of God's nature might we encounter? The psalm read, our soul waits for she who saves. She is our help and our shield. In our Isaiah reading, the liberators of Jerusalem are the daughters who are tasked to shelter the outcasts of Moab. The prophet imploring the women of Jerusalem to embrace and protect even the women of foreign lands and peoples. For when the violence is no more and the destruction has ceased and those who trample have vanished from the land, then in faithful love a throne shall be established. In the years following her deposition, Queen Lilio Kalani was known for her philanthropy and continued to work to preserve the Hawaiian language and culture, and in particular, in educating and supporting Hawaiian girls. She founded a trust that provided tuition for girls that still exists today. And every year on her birthday, September 2nd, there is a festival in her honor. And this past week, hundreds of advocates and protesters almost all women held vigil at Ayalani Palace on the anniversary of the day that she was forcibly removed from her throne in that very building. They assembled as a remembrance of not only who she was, but to carry on the legacy that she began in elevating the need of the Hawaiian people to preserve their culture, their land and environment, and their political autonomy. Their march was described by reporters as solemn and reverent, with different groups singing songs to the Pua Alai Ia Namia, I know I butchered that, I apologize, who are the preservers of Hawaiian culture, their music and their dance, and to enter the palace grounds they sang these songs that were reflective of their tradition to ask permission before entering into sacred and meaningful places. And watching these groups on the news this week, we encounter a very particular reality around faith and sacred tradition. They are usually preserved by the women, passed down from mother to child. And within our own context, I ask you to right now look around this very sanctuary. The majority of people in this room are women. In the time of Jesus, it was a woman who ensures his birth, and it will be women like Tabitha, Lydia, Damaris, and Priscilla who frequently will provide the disciples with money a house in which to meet, food, and the critical support for their ministries, often becoming recognized as full disciples in their own right. It was a woman, sorry, it was women who drove the abolitionist movement, who ignited the civil rights movement, and of course, women's suffrage all the way through Me Too. And while it is easy to regard all of these social political movements, as just that, political. They actually began out of spiritual and religious conviction. Convictions that God's desire for humanity resides on the side of the oppressed. In elevating people out of their suffering and into the fullness of God's plan for each of our lives. 
Women come to these movements often out of the tears cried over children unjustly murdered, out of labor unfairly manipulated and coerced, out of the violation of their very own bodies. We form a sisterhood of salvation, not because we seek power over, but because we hold deep within our own marrow generations of experience of the consequences of human sin. Now, the allegory of the Garden of Eden has been used to justify the subjugation and erasure of women since we put scripture to parchment. But when we read the story, the snake goes to Eve because she's the one that's going to need convincing. Adam is fully passive in the story. If Adam was the one with leadership and power, why wouldn't the snake go to him first? He goes to Eve because she's the one who will need to be persuaded. Who he needs to argue the logic with. Who he needs to convince that God is somehow holding all the knowledge and that that is unjust. Adam is just along for the ride. And if we need a mythologized source for why women across culture and history have taken onto themselves the role of protecting and ensuring the spiritual formation of our offspring, I believe we can look to Eve, who upon being manipulated into the awareness of good and evil, has left a legacy of using that knowledge to protect, defend, and educate her children from the ravages of our darkest human impulses. It is in suffering that we can empathize with the suffering of others. It is in seeking salvation that we enable the salvation of others. This happens without pomp or circumstance, often without recognition or even remembrance. Yet it happens. Traditions, story, and yes, faith are passed along generation to generation in the quiet lilts of a lullaby and the everyday moments we have growing up to the reality that on any given Sunday, the pews are filled with more women than men in churches all across this country. In her most famous song, Queen Liliu Kalani writes, using the English translation, sweet memories come back to me, bringing fresh remembrances of the past. Farewell to thee, farewell to thee, until we meet again. Within our very scriptures, we encounter opportunities to bring back the memories of our sisters of faith to embrace a God who is as fully female as male and a Christ who is born of a human woman without whom the fullness of his presence and purpose on earth could not have been realized. It is a sisterhood not meant to be exclusionary, but rather to afford us a new lens through which to sit and experience the divine truth of God from a perspective that has often been derided dismissed, yet contains within it a profound path to reconciliation and hope, where we will meet God again. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, it is in the stories of our mothers, our aunties, our sisters, our daughters. It is in their lived experience that often the fullness of who you are becomes starkly clear. And sometimes it takes a moment of remembrance to look deep into events of our past that highlight how often women are silenced dethroned, subjugated, and used. And yet, 
They continue to write music and sing songs, to teach, to mold and to shape and to nurture generation after generation. So help us to keep our eyes open to all the ways in which you nurture and strengthen us. Help us to be willing to consider all the ways in which that which is feminine truly defines and nourishes who you are and our understanding of you. It is a shift in thinking. It is sometimes difficult, even for women, to be able to hold that fullness of, of you. So keep our eyes and ears open and continue to guide us in new ways of understanding and being. For it is in there that we will find hope. In your holy name, amen. As we turn to this time of offering, um, I'll remind everyone that there are a couple of ways you can give if you choose to do so. You can put your offering in the plates out in the narthex. Uh, you can also give a donation through the mail or uh, you do a donation online. Please join me in prayer. God of grace, your limitless love gave us everything in Jesus. And through belief in him, you offer us life in your kingdom. Accept our gifts, but as we give, warm and soften our hearts to lead us into lives which reflect your generosity. Amen.
Please be seated. We come to our time for our prayers of the people and just ask that um, I'll pray collectively for us, then I'll open it up to those here within the sanctuary if you have prayers. And then those of you who are on Zoom, go ahead and type your prayer requests into the chat and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we gather as people who are going through it. We have people who are mending broken bones and healing from illnesses and falls. And as these stories compound, we are mindful that we are mortal, that we have bodies that are fragile, and that we're all getting a little older. So we just ask for your healing touch and your calming presence to be with all of us. We pray particularly for Ethel who fell and broke her arm this week. Um, it was actually last Sunday, a week ago today. Um, we just pray for her healing and we pray for her daughter, Carol, who cares for her. We just ask that they both have strength and um, are able to feel the joy of your presence as Ethel's body heals. We also pray for Sally and Jan, Katie, Evan, and Tricia, all who are dealing with their own injuries and bones that need knitting. It is such a challenge to be in that space where things don't work right and we want to get better. And so we just ask for your presence, for people to come alongside them who can be of support and help, and sometimes just for wisdom. The doctors know or can figure out what's wrong and can outline solid and progressive courses of treatment. And so we just ask that all of these hurts are mended. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we ask for um, prayers for uh, safety and rescue for women and girls all across the world who are being trafficked. It is utter darkness and brutality and sin that these women are used in this way. They're beaten and tortured and held for the purpose of male pleasure. Help us to find ways to end this, not only on a global scale and a political scale, but within our own understandings. The ways in which we view women this way get perpetuated in literature, on movies, in song. Our attitudes around what women are for and how they are to be used it's deep within us in a way that we have to be very, very conscious of undoing. So help us to continue to find ways, even small ways, that we can help put an end to this pure sin. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask for prayers for women to have access to medical care, that their decisions over their bodies are theirs, that they can be made privately within the conjunction of their own consciousness and that of their doctors, that it is something that you guide within them and no one else needs to know or legislate or even have opinion on. Because what brings us to those moments sometimes crisis, sometimes violence. And even if it's not either of those things, it is still our bodies. And we should be able to choose what happens to them. So Lord, we just ask that we can have patience, that we can seek to have justice over women's bodies. Both of these prayer requests reflect 
the removal of those from women and the deep pain that it causes them. So Lord, we just ask for your continued wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we offer up blessings of praise for Gary and for his continued improved health. We are so thrilled that his cancer is disappearing. And we pray that he has strength as he continues to go through the treatment, that he can find just that energy that has been so lacking for him. And I know he's frustrated by it. So we just ask that you continue to heal his body and that he can find ways to be rejuvenated. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we open up the concerns of our hearts knowing that you hear all, whether spoken or unspoken. Lord, we offer up prayers for our session, which we'll meet this week, as they outline the budget for the coming year and the hard and difficult decisions that often go into that conversation. We pray for their um, inspiration, for their willingness to go into places and conversations that are hard. And we just pray that the future of this congregation wherever it goes and however it lands, that people will be open to where it is that the Spirit is taking us and to have the confidence that you have placed a call upon this congregation. It has a future. So help us to find the best way to navigate it. And we pray for each of those elders as they work through that process and continue to lead us in the coming year. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Offer prayers for Adelia's Aunt Kay, who is having emergency surgery this morning. We pray for her body to be healed. We pray for the medical team that is attending her, that they will be able to uh, address the issues that are, are endangering her right now. And we pray for her family as they come alongside her and hold her in prayer and then have to care and, and heal her as she moves through the recovery process. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we come together in one voice, praying the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
You may be seated. Uh, just as always, there will be a coffee hour in the library, so you are all welcome to join us for that. And our charge this week is to try to see the way that God shines through the woman in our, all of our lives. Grace, mercy, and peace be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in truth and love. And all God's children say, Amen. <laughs>